I'm Dan Klein, and joining me today on the Seven Investing Podcast is Mark Manduka, Chief Investment Officer for GXO Logistics. If that's a name you've never heard, it's because that is a relatively new company. They were essentially born on August 2nd. We'll get to that in a second. GXO is a spinoff of XBO Logistics. XBO Logistics is a top 10 global logistics provider of supply chain solutions to some of the most successful companies in the world. They probably also help some unsuccessful companies. They're a really big company. Mark is responsible for analysis of GXO's growth opportunities, optimization of the company's asset portfolio, and oversight of its UK pension investments. Alongside these responsibilities, he will play a key role in ensuring that GXO's investment case reaches a global audience. That, as you might imagine, is their text and not mine. Mark, before we get into it, let me say congratulations and welcome to the program. And thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, it is your time. We appreciate it. So let me, let me set the table a bit here, because while XBO is a really big name, most Americans probably only know it from when their delivery shows up. It's not a pop culture name. It's not one we, we talk about all that often. So XBO spun off GXO. Uh, that's its logistics segment on, uh, segment on August 2nd, so relatively recently or incredibly recently. That creates two pure play companies. GXO is now the largest pure play contract ah, logistics provider in the world. And GXBO is a leading provider and XBO is a leading provider of transportation services, primarily less than truckload transportation and truck brokerages. Mark, why don't you explain a little bit in layman's terms what that means and what GXO is going to be doing versus what XBO does, but focus on GXO here. XBO business that had a brokerage business, which is effectively moving freight around the world. It is a business that had a large LTL, so a, a less than full truckload trucking business. Um, and then there's the last portion of it, which is the warehousing portion of the three big businesses that make up the majority of XBO's profit. The warehouses have been spun off in the last week. So last Monday, they got spun off and was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So now we have our own ticker, GXO, and 869 warehouses, 27 countries, roughly 100,000 teammates and workforce across the world. And we are super energized for the growth opportunity going forwards. We're growing at roughly 8 to 12% next year on revenues and on profit are roughly around 14 to 20%. So we couldn't be more excited. We're excited for you. Now, why the split? We, we've seen this happen with other companies and sometimes it works. If you're uh, PayPal, you're really happy you split from eBay. If you're eBay, not so happy you don't own PayPal. What was the logic here for the split? It's very simple. When, you're, when your company isn't well understood by the market and when your company isn't therefore getting the right valuation that it deserves, sometimes you need to shine a light on a great asset. This is great company spinning out great company in its purest form. But for us, it was about that value realization. And then on top of that, I think what you saw with this business was an opportunity to really delineate what great looked like, an opportunity to take back control of hiring decisions and strategic transactions in a ring-fenced, very strong investment grade balance sheet. So there's a lot of excitement here and a lot of energy about what we can do going forwards in terms of signing new customers, in terms of delighting our existing customers, under this new umbrella brand. Will the two companies still have a working relationship? It would seem that that, that would be pretty logical. It's a ring fence company, GXO. So the working relationship will be purely contractual like any other company that you have across the, uh, the trucking and brokerage sphere. So our, our business is utterly ring fenced and it is utterly spun out 100%. So let's talk a little bit about logistics. First, mm -hmm. what do you mean by contract logistics? What's inside the warehouse for us is what contract logistics really means. People have different terms for it, supply chain management, warehousing, contract logistics, logistics. But when we think about what we do for our customers, we operate within those warehouses and we help them manage their inventory, get their product back into store quicker, make sure that the customers get their product back when they sometimes buy it or sometimes even when they return it. But imagine this. A thousand t-shirts come into a warehouse, they need to be sorted, palleted, and then sent off to their final destination for sale. In some cases, you can send it back to the consumer. In some cases, you'll send it to a storefront. But you're effectively managing inventory for the customer, making sure that they can manage 100% of their reputation and 100% of their revenue, because ultimately, you are the last person to touch the product 
It's an oh so important role in the overall value chain of how to get product to the consumer. And we play that role with, with huge efficacy and pride. So we talk about this a lot in the retail space that uh, many of the biggest players, uh, your Amazons of the world, your Walmarts have completely reconfigured their supply chain so they can handle something like, okay, I ordered it. Well, how do you send it to me from the closest store to me? How do you make sure, uh, Nike's another one that's done this really well. How do you make sure that the size 13 sneakers sitting in a warehouse in Orlando don't get shipped to the order in LA, they get shipped to the order in, uh, in Virginia or whatever is logic. So is, is your service basically to help all of the companies that aren't those absolute top tier giants sort of make this happen and compete in that logistics space? We have contracts across the spectrum in terms of size. And what we offer is that Cadillac service. It's that white glove, absolute on-time desired service, a premium service dedicated for our customers across those 869 warehouses. We tend to do less of the multi-tenant warehouse type operation. We have an amazing growth engine in the form of, uh, of, of GXO Direct, and that provides us another growth angle in what is already a very high growth business. But e-commerce is our bread and butter, and we really focus on precision. We focus on making sure there are limited time delays. We get products back into store quicker. We get products returned quicker. We are ultimately focused on that expertise that we've had over the last 20 to 30 years as a business, driving that through uh, to our customer solutions today. And we do it with a huge tech advantage as well. Now, we've got roughly around 3,100 ro robots coming into our, our network by the end of this year from a collaborative robot perspective. So we're very excited about the tech advantage that we have versus our other 3PL competitors and the tech solutions that we can therefore offer to our customers who are delighted in turn. I want to talk about the tech in a second, but first let's establish a little bit and you don't have to, this doesn't have to be expansive. Just give me yeah. some examples of who on some level you'd consider competitors. It's very simple. I'll give you the, I'll give you the broad market. So at the top of the market, you have the conglomerates. You've got the Deutsche Posts of this world that obviously have DHL. They make up around 9% of the market. Um, we have around 5% of the market with the largest pure play dedicated provider, as I mentioned, which comes with its advantages, as you can imagine, being really focused on one thing. Then, of course, you've got the, the other conglomerates, whether it's Kunas, DSVs, whether it's the Geodices of this world. Um, it could even be the Hitachis over in Japan. They're the other conglomerates that sit within this top five, top six, six sphere. Then you have the local champions, the, the heroes such as uh, Clipper, Win Canton, ID Logistics, all phenomenal businesses and very much focused on what they do best. When you think about the tail of the industry, that's where it becomes very interesting. Because what's happened here is, is that the market ultimately is very fragmented amongst a number of mom and pops. And arguably, there is an opportunity to consolidate this market from an organic standpoint by just winning market share over time, and also inorganically as well by ultimately taking market share through M&A. And I think we're focused on both. Clearly, our key focus is going to be on capitalizing on some of these phenomenal growth opportunities that we have across automation, e-commerce, and outsourcing, which are going to be one of the, one of the drivers behind our, our growth story from a revenue and, and EBITDA standpoint going forwards. But our ability to also acquire is going to be part of that, part of our good balance sheet, part of our heritage, as you know, of how we came about. So this business is going to have strong organic growth. And I think in the right places, strong inorganic growth as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the growth cycle for logistics. I've talked about this a lot. In the US, uh, online sales are about 13%. It's like 13.8%. So that's a relatively small amount. During the height of the pandemic, it went up a little. but do you see a big part of your growth just being that your existing company customers just do more business? I mean, I know I've placed three online orders today and it's, it's 11.50 in the morning. Now I'm not home and I've thought of things I need that might not be typical, but I think that's kind of where we're going, where there's an awful lot of, hey, here's who I use and I'm gonna use them more. Is that a big part of your growth story here? Completely, a big part of our growth story is gonna be existing customers doing more in the e-commerce field. So we have uh, the 8 to 12% growth that I talked about for next year. Just to give you a sense of numbers, 3 to 4% of that growth is coming from existing customers, and 5 to 8% is coming from growth from new customers going forwards. So to get you to that, that growth algorithm of 8 to 12%, you can see it's broadly evenly split with a slight tilt towards new customer wins. 
What I would also say in terms of your, your point about growth going forwards is that e-commerce is barely penetrated. We've been talking about it for 20 years, but it's still only 20% penetrated. So the opportunity for you to not just buy three things this morning, but to buy eight to 12 things this morning <laughs> is only going to go up going forward. Then, of course, there's outsourcing. Outsourcing right now in terms of the potential addressable market for a business such as ours as the leader on a pure play basis with only seven and a half to 7.7 .7 billion of revenue in a market that is $430 billion, our ability to grow within that market is significant. So from that perspective, it's only 30% penetrated from an outsourcing standpoint. Lots of room to bring those in-house contracts into the outsourced market. So that's exciting. And then of course, when you think about automation, our leading edge here is that we have 30% of our business that is tech enabled, 30%. The average industry competitor is only five. So from that standpoint, we have advantages across the piece. We've got some mega secular tailwinds and our customers are doing more and more e-commerce by the day, which therefore is just underpinning at an idiosyncratic level, underpinning these massive macro tailwinds that we have as a business. So how do you manage the balance between automation and human workers. And I'll give a bit of an example. And it's just one, it's not in your field. It's one anyone can understand. You walk into a Target and they've gotten rid of a lot of cashiers and there's what I'd call automated chaos. And they have to throw people at it uh, to solve the problem. Now, is that a forever problem? No, but it shows that there's definitely some, some logistics not working there where, hey, I wanna buy alcohol, someone has to come over. I don't know how to get a receipt, whatever it is. As a company managing on a much bigger level than me checking out at a Target, how are you figuring out when, it, when do we employ an automated solution? When do we employ, deploy a human solution? Well, it's very simple. First and foremost, when it comes to automation and robotics and cobots and vision technology, there's a customer element, which is improving customer efficiency. But there's also a people element, of course, which is this idea of making the workplace a safer, more efficient place to operate. So that's very much at the forefront of our mind. We're driving efficiency and savings for our customers but at the same time enhancing our workspaces across our circa 100,000 employees. So it's an important, but comes in both hands. The left hand is definitely speaking to a right hand in this business. We have a strong ESG backbone as an operation. And as a result, this is very much about people working with robots and cobots rather than people versus robots and cobots going forwards. It enhances the worker experience, it enhances the customer experience, and that's why we like to lead and invest so heavily in our technology. This is actually something I've talked about a lot. It's, it's really easy to, to fear this robot future where everything is automated, but here's the reality. There's a cost logic of automation, and the one that drives me nuts, and I'm sure you've seen this uh, living in Connecticut, there's that Domino's commercial where they show a full truck that can deliver two medium pizzas, that's not going to be the future. That's not going to be what happens. Whereas the stuff we don't see, and I'm curious if you're using any of this technology, is the drone that's taking inventory in a warehouse, mm. which is a, a safe, closed environment. What types of automation and robots are you using? Again, without giving away any trade secrets. We don't need to know, uh, you know something that, that wouldn't be public. No, we're very much open book here. If you think about our, our robotics, we're doing a variety of different automation software suites for our, or hardware suites for our customers. And it's the way we stack those robotics. We, we insource a number of different uh, robotics providers, whether it's uh, the gantries or whether it's uh, the, the robotic arms, the, the cranes that we use across our operation. It's very much unique to us in the way that we stack the technology for our customers, sourcing some of the world's best technology, as I'm sure you can imagine. On the software side, we have our labor productivity tool, which is called GXO Smart. That is a labor productivity tool that is proprietary to us. And it saves customers around five to 7% in terms of labor productivity, picking up problems quickly, making the workspace a more efficient and safe place to operate. It's a phenomenal tool and customers actually sign contracts with us in part because of that GXO smart software. So it's a, it's a game changer in the sphere. So as we start to wrap up here, um, one of your jobs is raising awareness. Do you need to raise awareness so me, and I don't mean talk show host, uh, investing guy me, I mean me like regular American consumer, do I need to know your name or do, do the leaders of industries need to know your name? Like, do you have to become a household brand or can you stay a behind the scenes, uh, you know, not necessarily forefront player? This is a, a customer driven business. And in so many ways, that is 
99.9% of everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We're utterly customer and shareholder focused as an operation. When you are, when you are operating a spin the way we have been doing in such a short period of time, the typical spins can take 12 to 18 months, you have to make sure that you do everything efficiently. And that obviously has, has been a big part of, of the investor outreach that we've been doing, the sell side outreach, the media outreach, the podcast outreach. It's been a big part of, of that process. It's something that we've really enjoyed as well, getting the message out there of this amazing brand with this amazing workforce across so many different countries. And it's something that we definitely want to keep in terms of a relationship, because naturally, Keeping, keeping the good word out there about the good things that we're doing drives this flywheel of new customer wins, customers talking about you to other customers, the media talking about you about the customers. It causes this sequence of events, which results in a better, funner, more energetic place to work. So one of my key roles is going to be making sure that we have a great dialogue with, um, with, with, with the likes of yourselves, uh, the media across a number of different sell side analysts and a number of cross investing houses as well. So we're just super excited that people are talking about us, the reception that we've received, and we're just going to do a really, really good job for our customers and our shareholders going forward. That's our, our primary objective, bar none. We appreciate the enthusiasm. We appreciate the openness. One of the things we do at 7investing is unearth uh, investing opportunities that you may not have thought of, because obviously, it's easy to look out there and go, hey, I want to be in retail. I'll buy Amazon shares. And that's great. Like I, I own Amazon shares. On the other hand, everything that's be happening behind the scenes. So let's ask a question about consumer logistics. And I know you're not doing last mile, but, but this obviously plays into it. It mm -hmm. used to be that three to five delivery day delivery was just fine. Then it became two day delivery was the, the norm set by Amazon. Then it became one day delivery. And mm -hmm. now we're seeing same day delivery. Do we think that bar keeps rising? Or at some point, I know, I don't care if you give me same day or two day delivery. It doesn't matter 99% of the time. Do you think we're going to see increasing customer demand? Or we've kind of plateaued that there's going to be this mix of sort of zero, one and two? Absolutely not. I think this is going to continue. I think this is going to be a drive towards the last mile. And it only points towards why you need a great partner like us not only to source the right labor forces within those, within those jurisdictions, closer and closer to the last mile, sourcing the right real estate, having the, having the bargaining power to be able to do those things at scale and with speed in short order. These are very, very important tenants of a great 3PL like us. So to be able to have that scale is oh so important in a world where that you're describing, which is a customer wants it today, this hour, tomorrow, not in three days time. It's a trend that will continue. It's a trend that we're seeing on the ground at the moment across all our e-commerce customers. The bar is being raised further and further. The demands of our customers are going up and that is gravitating them towards a scale player such as us. So what you've just described is exactly the reason why a 3PL like us exists and why we earn our margin for our customers. It's hard fought, but it's well-deserved. Let's, let's close out here a little bit. And first of all, I will point out that I ordered an iced coffee this morning, and that is an important thing to get delivered within a limited amount of time. But the other things I ordered today, uh, a new watch, some batteries, whatever, not that important. But let's close out. What is one thing the investing community and the seven investing audience here doesn't know about your company that you wish was out there? At the moment, we are trading on a low teens multiple, and our peers are trading at a high teens multiple. And there are acquisitions in the space that are taking place at high teens multiples. This to me, if life is about spotting anomalies in the investing community, this to me is, is an anomaly that sits at the forefront of my mind of, of all the many stocks that I've covered over the last 20 years. For me, the crystallization of that value is gonna be fascinating as we deliver upon our results and we earn that higher multiple going forwards and watch the share price appreciate. It's our job to earn the trust of the market as a new company going forwards. There are a few skeptics out there as to the prowess and brilliance of the third party logistics business model. And we're here to prove them both right and wrong in equal measure. And we're gonna do a great job of pleasing our shareholders over the coming years. You've been listening to Mark Manduka. He is the chief investment officer for GXO Logistics, a company that is what is today the ninth, a company that is one week old, though obviously it has a 
a long history in its, in its previous incarnation. Mark, thank you for doing the 7 Investing podcast. Thanks, Dan. I am Dan Klein. We are 7 Investing, empowering you to invest in your future.